Hello everybody, welcome to our 100th guide. So to celebrate that, let's look at a ship that we can look at in a lot more detail. And the Ark Royal seems like the appropriate ship. Just so happens, luckily, that it was on the list and was the 100th ship anyway. So, yeah, fortune favours the fortunate, I guess. Let's continue with this ship review. So the Ark Royal was the first purpose-built fleet carrier for the Royal Navy. The fleet up to this point consisted of converted ships like Eagle, Argus, Glorious, Furious and Courageous, and the small purpose-built Hermes. Originally, the Royal Navy was supposed to get purpose-built fleet carriers in the 1920s, but economic factors forced this to be put off until the early 1930s. Unlike previous carriers, where the hull, which was usually converted, was stripped down to the main deck and then a hangar built on top of it as a separate structure, the Ark Royal's two hangar decks were an integrated part of the hull, making the flight deck also the equivalent of the main deck in a regular ship, which offered protection to blast and splinters for the aircraft carried within, as well as making the ship exceptionally tall. The flight deck was relatively strong, but not armoured, and extended significantly past the length of the waterline hull. This was a neat little design cheat that kept the hull within the dimensions of many existing dockyards, whilst maximising the flight deck length and area. She was equipped with the relatively new technologies of arrestor hooks and catapults, with the aim of minimising the space on the flight deck needed for actual flight operations, whilst leaving more space for aircraft to be brought up, stored and prepared, thus improving her operational sortie rate. The lack of the armoured deck that would characterise all other Royal Navy fleet carriers built in the run-up to and during World War II was partially down to an effort to stick to the treaty limits on carrier size, and partially because at the time the anticipated enemy was more likely to be Japan, a scenario in which a larger air group was more useful than the later focus on the European theatre and survivability. But more on that in an upcoming special video. These measures gave the ship a designed complement of 72 aircraft without using a deck park, Although these were early 1930s aircraft, and the increase in the size of warplanes over the decade meant that once she was fully in service, her flight group was somewhat reduced at between 50 and 60 in normal operations. The ship would be propelled by three screws connected to engines producing just over 100,000 shaft horsepower for a maximum speed of between 30 and 31 knots. The ship was not supposed to be engaging enemy surface targets, although the main protection carried was a 4.5 inch belt over the engine spaces, just in case. Her defensive armament consisted of 16 4.5 inch guns in twin turrets. This was dual purpose, but primarily aligned for the anti-aircraft role. Four octuple 40mm pom-poms and eight quad 50 calibre machine guns supplemented this battery in the pure anti-aircraft role. The ship would be laid down in 1935 and launched in 1937, commissioning at the end of 1938. A number of exercises using the carrier would test and evaluate a wide variety of aircraft and operational concepts. One set of exercises during this period strongly influenced further carrier design as it found that even with aircraft primed and ready to go on deck, even if they were launched the moment an enemy strike was detected visually and reported by the fleet, the fighters could not reach the operational altitude of incoming attackers in time due to the increased speed of new strike aircraft. No combat air patrol would reasonably be strong enough to break up a large assault, and so the Royal Navy went back to the drawing board with this information. Of course, the advent of shipborne radar a few years later would vastly increase the carrier's spotting range as well as that of its escorts, but this little gap was greatly influential on the development of the Royal Navy's World War II carrier fleet. The Ark Royal would operate most, most of the late 1930s Fleet Air Arm aircraft, so skewers, swordfish and fulmers being common sights on her decks, with occasional appearances by rocks, albacores, and even the odd walrus over the years. The ship started its wartime career as part of the Royal Navy's short-lived plan to hunt submarines with fleet carriers, brought to a screeching halt by the loss of the Courageous to a U-boat. <laughs> 
But in the time that Ark Royal was on these operations, it had a narrow escape from the U-39, which it and its escorts then managed to hunt down, thus gaining the first U-boat kill of the war. But it was unable to destroy the U-30, which was attacking a nearby merchant ship. Later on, on a mission to rescue a friendly submarine, her skewers would shoot down an attacking Dornier 18, thereby also achieving the first British aerial kill of the war. Now, if only she'd wandered closer to the Belgian coast, she could have shelled the advancing Germans and completed a trifecta with the first British land kill as well. But, oh well. Things happen. The Germans retaliated with a raid by Junkers 88 bombers, but Ark Royal demonstrated the start of a noble trend of British carriers in dodging as much as possible, and evaded the only bomber that made it through her anti-aircraft fire. However, the massive splash and some faulty recon led the Germans to claim that they had actually sunk the ship. This would be the first of several such claims. The Ark Royal then showing up intact in port later on was somewhat embarrassing for the Nazi propaganda machine. Her next mission would see her hunting the Graf Spee in the South Atlantic alongside the battlecruiser Renown. Her aircraft did find the supply ship Altmark, but it was successfully disguised at the time, so they didn't realise what they'd found. A number of neutral ships who saw the aircraft thought that they were about to be bombed and abandoned ship. The aircraft crews tried to explain by dropping notes in bags to the fleeing crews. In one case this was successful, and the Norwegian crew successfully reboarded their ship. In another case, it was somewhat less so, as clearly the bomber pilot instinct took over, and the note was dropped in a perfect textbook attack, straight down the merchant ship's funnel. Although they were a day and a half away from the Graf Spee when it was located in Montevideo, some clever work by British intelligence agents by renting out dock space and buying up a ton of fuel in a nearby port convinced the Germans that the ship was in fact much closer and about to arrive, contributing in significant part to the decision to scuttle the Graf Spee. After escorting the Exeter home from its fight with the German ship, she was sent to the Mediterranean for a while, before being recalled due to the in German invasion of Norway, alongside HMS Glorious. She would then operate in the patrol, fighter cover and strike roles off the Norwegian coast with a variety of escorts, with the Germans doing their best to bomb her again, and of course claiming to have sunk her again. Apparently unaware of her own destruction, the Ark Royal would then help to evacuate Norway, as the land campaign was going somewhat less successfully than her own operations. She was still covering these efforts when Glorious, which had left ahead of the rest of the fleet, was located and sunk by Scharnhorst and Gneisenor. A sweep by the Ark Royal's own air group to try and counterattack the German ships was unsuccessful in locating them at sea, and a follow-up attack on the ships in port was quite the failure. Following restocking of aircraft and resupply, the ship would be sent back to the Mediterranean to join Force H at Gibraltar. Operating from this base, she would provide artillery spotting for British forces at Mers el Kabir, although her aircraft were unable to successfully slow down or sink the Dunkirk as it escaped. After this, she would make supply runs to Malta, supplying hurricanes as well as a number of attacks on Italian bases along the Italian coast while she was at it. She would also cover reinforcements heading for the British fleet based at the other end of the Mediterranean later in the year, along with operations against the Vichy French at Dakar before heading home for a short refit. With the refit complete, it was back to Gibraltar and escort duties for convoys bound for Malta and Alexandria, which resulted in a relatively inconclusive slap fight with the Italian Navy that nevertheless distracted everyone long enough for the convoy to reach safety. More escort duty, raids, and the occasional hunt for commerce raiders saw out the end of 1940. 1941 opened with another crack at the two Scharnhorsts, which were now raiding the Atlantic. Although, once again, Ark Royal wasn't able to find them at first, she did find three captured merchant ships, recovering one and causing the other two to scuttle. Then, a long comedy of errors began. A Fulmar found the ships, but its radio broke, and it couldn't tell anyone till it got back to the ship, by which point fog had closed in. 
The next day, patrols were launched to find them again, but a rather overly enthusiastic catapult hurled a swordfish forward so hard the wings ripped off and a rather surprised fuselage with pilot was hurled into the sea ahead of the ship. Running at full speed, the ship ran over the aircraft and its depth charges went off underneath the ship. Needless to say, the Germans reached harbour safely and the Ark Royal headed in for repairs, whilst the catapult was told that aircraft were not in fact projectiles and it should never do this again. The spring saw more convoy escort duty and aircraft delivery runs to Malta, until in May a convoy with an exceptionally heavy escort was organised to reinforce British troops in North Africa, as Rommel was in one of his more successful phases and it looked like he might reach the Suez Canal. Knowing exactly how important this convoy was, and seeing that it was limited to 14 knots by the speed of the transports, the German and Italian air forces lined up to attack. Several waves, each containing dozens of attackers, were countered by the ship's fighters and combined anti-aircraft firepower from the ship and its escorts, greatly helped by radar guidance from HMS Sheffield. May 1941 would see Ark Royal drawn into one of the most famous incidents of World War II, the hunt for the Bismarck. With the loss of the Hood, basically every combat-capable unit with a hope of reaching the operational area was sent after the German ship. Force H was among them, although with the loss of the Hood, Renown was ordered not to engage Bismarck unless the latter was already engaged with another Royal Navy battleship and after three days of searching, swordfish from the carrier found the Bismarck and a strike was prepared. Fifteen rather nervous swordfish were launched by catapult, fortunately the catapult was behaving this time, and with the latest magnetic detonators on their torpedoes they took off for the attack. Then somehow mistook the cruiser Sheffield for a German battleship and promptly launched an assault. Fortunately for the Sheffield, the detonators, as with most magnetic detonators in the early part of the Second World War, were hopelessly terrible, and the torpedoes either exploded on contact with the water, or else failed to explode at all as Sheffield took evasive action. Luckily for the pilots, they found this out during this attack, and promptly rearmed with the older contact detonators for a second strike. This strike flew in just before sunset, with the old and slow swordfish merrily flying through a hail of flak fire, their canvas and wood construction letting fragments and shells that likely would have downed a more modern aircraft simply poke minor irritating holes in them, although some of the pilots and navigators were also wounded. Uh, but three torpedoes did find their mark. The German torpedo defence system largely protected the ship against the two impacts amidships, but the third was the critical one. This was the one that jammed the ship's rudder and sent it sailing in wild circles throughout the night. As a direct result of this, and the limited steering possible using engines only thanks to its three-screw design, Bismarck would be met the next day by HMS Rodney and King George V and sunk. Aircraft ready for a follow-up strike circled King George V for a while, but were politely told to please go away. This was something of a high point for the crew of the Ark Royal, but the situation in the Mediterranean brought things back into focus. Malta could now only be supplied from Gibraltar, as Germany had invaded Greece and Crete, and Rommel was about to make a push into Egypt. So it was back to supply runs and aircraft deliveries to Malta through the summer, including some major convoy runs such as Operation Halberd. Keeping Malta going was critical as a great amount of supplies that could have tipped the balance in Rommel's favour were being intercepted and sunk by forces based out of Malta, especially the S-Class and U-Class submarines operating out of the Grand Harbour. Partially as a response to this, Hitler ordered a number of U-boats to the Mediterranean, although Admiral Rada didn't want to do this as he viewed them as more useful against the Atlantic convoys. This decision would prove fateful for the Ark Royal, as on the 13th of November, the U-81 managed to score a hit with a single torpedo right underneath the ship's island. The escorting destroyer Legion had probably heard the launch on its sonar earlier, but had misidentified it as the noises of another friendly destroyer. The bad luck didn't stop there. The torpedo had actually malfunctioned, but in so doing, it had run deep. Against anything up to the size of a cruiser, this would have meant it simply passed under the ship 
without doing any harm, but the deeper draught of the Ark Royal meant it hit the ship very far down, having managed to unintentionally duck under the bulk of the torpedo protection system. This immediately flooded the starboard boiler room, the electrical switchboard, and a number of oil tanks, plus about 100 foot of the bilge on that side of the ship. This rather understandably cut communications across the ship, as well as all power aft of the island. The overall size of the hole was 130 foot wide by 30 foot tall, demonstrating just what torpedoes were capable of against a ship's hull in this time period, when they weren't troubled by the torpedo defence systems. Due to the loss of communications, the ship couldn't be stopped until a runner from the bridge had gone all the way down the island across the flight deck, down through the hangars, and down through pretty much the entire ship to reach the engine rooms to tell them to cut it out. And the pressure of the water moving at speed before the ship was stopped made the hole even larger, leaving the ship listing at almost 20 degrees by the time it was finally brought to a halt. Knowing that both Courageous and Glorious had gone down rapidly with heavy loss of life, and currently only facing a single fatality from the initial impact, Captain Maund ordered the crew to abandon ship with the exception of the damage control party. Although very well motivated, this left various leaks unattended for almost an hour in total after the torpedo hit, and the evacuation meant that a lot of bulkhead doors were opened and then left open, further allowing the flooding to spread, reaching the central boiler room and cutting power to the rest of the ship before the remaining damage control party could descend back to do their jobs. This did, however, have the effect of partially counter-flooding the ship and the list recovered somewhat. The damage control parties eventually found a boiler on the port side that they could light, which restored power to the pumps, and a destroyer came alongside to provide more power and pumping capacity. Unfortunately, these efforts hadn't managed to control the rising flood water, and these put out the relit boiler and began to spread along the long expanses of the engine compartments, bringing the list back with increasing severity. By about 0400 the next morning, it was clear that the ship was not going to be recovered, and the ship was abandoned for a second time. As the ship rolled over, the fatally weakened hull snapped in half, the one bright spot of all this being that, with the exception of that first fatality, every single other man on board had been safely evacuated. The subsequent investigations into the sinking found the captain at fault on two charges, one of not ensuring prompt and proper damage control efforts were in force for the duration, and the other being that the ship had not been properly ready to deal with combat damage, although they did acknowledge that the feat of rescuing basically the entire crew was noteworthy. More serious flaws were found in the ship's construction. Due to the attempt to get as big a ship out of the Treaty Limited displacement, there were no backup generators, so when the boilers had been flooded, there'd been no power for lights, pumps, and other equipment that could have helped save the ship. Additionally, the engine and boiler spaces had been left far too open, since bulkhead walls and doors had again been omitted, again in part to save weight, which allowed too much flooding once water reached relatively few spaces. These issues were promptly fixed in the follow-on carrier designs, although again this was tempered with an acknowledgement that if the torpedo had run at normal depths, the ship's torpedo defence system would likely have mitigated the damage to a point where many of these issues would not have occurred. But at the same time, relying on your enemies to perform in a way best for you was not something that should ever be relied upon. The wreck was rediscovered in 2002, with analysis showing that the initial investigation's conclusions were broadly accurate and the majority of the fault for the sinking arose from the design flaws in the ship, as opposed to the conduct of the crew. The Ark Royal still lies just south of Gibraltar and is in remarkably good condition uh, for a ship that snapped into on the way down, with a number of swordfish and other aircraft also preserved on the seabed. It would also be the only purpose-built British fleet carrier lost during the Second World War, with its legacy living on in the audacious class aircraft carrier Ark Royal built shortly after the war, and then the invincible class aircraft carrier Ark Royal again built during the 1980s. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below.
Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.